Hey, so hello everybody. I'm Simon Pimenta. I'm very excited today to be talking to nutritional therapist Crystal Mendes Dos Santos. Hi, Crystal. Hello. Do you want to just tell everyone where in the world you are? I'm in uh, London today and happy to say it's a nice sunny day here in the UK. It is. It's beautiful. <laughs> so um, let's start with you just telling everyone a bit about yourself, how you ended up becoming a nutritional therapist. Right. Um, well, as my name suggests, I'm half Brazilian, but I grew up in the beautiful countryside of Devon. Um, and if any of you know uh, this small part of Devon, Totnes, it's a very alternative town. Um, and my mum was also quite an alternative person. So we grew up eating organic foods, um, which we bought from our local farm, which is Riverford. If any of you are in the UK, you'll probably know that farm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my mum was very into alternative medicine. So we would see a homeopath instead of a doctor. Um, and we'd see an osteopath and acupuncturist and things like that. So um, I was very, I was brought up in a very alternative sense anyway. Um, but I never really appreciated the food that I was eating was um, actually playing a role in my health. I just knew that I, you know, I was enjoying my food and we had a nice, um, healthy lifestyle. And then um, when I was 19, I actually became ill with ME, although I didn't know it was ME at the time. Um, it was quite little known uh, at that point. So that was in 99. And um, yeah, so I was visiting the doctor and they were saying, oh, it's post-viral syndrome, whatever that was. Mm -hmm. um, so I became, as most ME sufferers will understand, quite desperate really. Um, and was looking at all aspects of my life and, and things that I could make a difference to and things that I could change. And um, although I had a health, pretty healthy diet, I was also a teenager. So I was um, you know, doing things that most teenagers do and you know, probably eating way too much sugar and drinking alcohol and those parties. So I had to really rein all that in and really focus on what was beneficial for my health and uh, focus on things that were going to promote energy as opposed to detract energy. Um, and so I worked really hard on my diet um, and, um, you know, cutting out sugar and um, alcohol, obviously anything like that, no caffeine, um, eating just really clean, light foods. Um, I found that I didn't have a lot of hunger because my energy was very low. Um, so I just eat really nutrient dense, dense foods. Um, and oh, gradually over a period of about six years, I managed to regain my health, um, along with a really strong passion for food. Right. So, um, yeah, long story short, <laughs> um, I then decided, actually it took me a few years to actually get onto a course to be able to afford to do the course. But, um, yeah, I, now a fully qualified nutritionist and really passionate about helping other people to understand the benefits of food and the role it plays in their health. Brilliant, excellent. Well, thanks for that introduction. So I want to move <coughs> on to my first question, which is from a, the perspective of a nutritional therapist, can you tell me what you believe to be the cause of the development of ME-CFS? Yeah, so, um, there's, there's been considerable amount of research into ME, although um, not as much uh, as, you know, some other chronic diseases, obviously, and, and, and more would be beneficial. But it seems that there's not one single etiology that has actually been recognized in the development of um, ME CFS. Um, and it's likely to be uh, multifactorial um, in the roles played in the development of CFS. Is it okay if I call it CFS or ME or are you quite specific? About Whatever uh, you're comfortable with, I generally use the term ME-CFS just because of the various issues surrounding the terminology, but whatever you feel comfortable with. Okay, all right. Um, so yeah, so that said, there, there's just a few um, interesting studies that I wanted to um, run through and share with you all. 
sure. um, and looking at different body systems. So um, the first one would be um, the mitochondria. So um, the mitochondria is like the um, energy powerhouse of each and every cell in our body. Um, and it's actually responsible for about 90% of our energy. Um, there can be multiple mitochondria per cell, depending on what that cell's used for. So a cardiac cell needs a lot of energy. So it will have a lot of mitochondrial cells contained within it. Um, so a study found that um, comparing CFS patients to healthy individuals um, found that CFS patients' mitochondria actually um, was um, not functioning properly and, and that actually correlated to the severity of their symptoms. Um, mitochondria supporting nutrient intervention have also been studied um, and found things like vitamins, minerals, amino acids, um, plant extract, phospholipids and fatty acids um, were all depleted and um, when introducing that following the intervention they reported about a 43 percent improvement um, in fatigue for me cfs and fibromyalgia patients right. um, and that was just in eight weeks so that was quite an important and interesting little um, study that they ran there um, another important factor is looking at inflammation and oxidative stress. So for those that don't know, oxidative stress is created in the body when there's an imbalance of um, um, uh, free radical produ production in the body and our natural sources of fighting against that, which is our antioxidant defences. And that, uh, sorry, that then causes something called oxidative stress. <clears throat> Again, so research has proposed that inflammation and oxidative stress um, as a fundamental um, pathological feature of CFS. And the role of oxidative stress in um, CFS is also a, an important area for current research and future studies. Mm -hmm. And the look and the, um, the use of antioxidants to support the management of, um, of that in any CFS patients. Um, so gastrointestinal dysfunction is another common one for CFS sufferers. Um, reported changes in, gut, in the gut include alterations in the gut microbiome, which is an imbalance between your healthy or your friendly and unfriendly bacteria. Um, it also looks at things like your mucosal barrier, which is considered your first line defense in immunity. So that's things like your nasal passage, your um, throat and your digestive tract. <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, so it's looking at dysfunctions in those areas and also increased intestinal, gastrointestinal permeability, which is also known as le leaky gut more commonly. Yeah, that's something I was diagnosed with by a medical doctor. Ah, okay, yeah. So that can play all kinds of havoc in the body and is, is definitely linked to similar symptoms with MECFS. Yeah. Um, well, I noticed when I would eat food, I would immediately feel exhausted. And the doctor yeah. explained that that's because food was getting into my bloodstream, yeah. in the pancreas to respond and bring my blood sugar levels down and then I would just crash yeah um, and actually doing a leaky gut protocol made a massive difference oh great that's really good yeah, yeah because the, the the cells in the intestines they just cut the, they get further and further apart the cells are normally close together and that's called a tight junction um, and as things um, if you're eating things that cause inflammation, they damage the, the, the gut lining and it starts to create these gaps where, like you say, the particles of the food pass through into the bloodstream and then it causes havoc. Yeah, um, yeah so that's really interesting that, that you actually saw benefit from doing a, a protocol. Yeah, I mean, really what happened is as a result of doing that protocol, I was able to tolerate exercise which, you know, I had been, my window of physical activity was very limited. And from doing that protocol, which took a few months, 
uh, to do it, uh, I had to take supplements for uh, that period, I, I definitely noticed a difference. Oh, really good. Great. And actually, I think it's interesting what you were saying earlier um, about not eating much, because I ate twice the amount I eat now. And I think that's partly because my body just wasn't digesting food. I felt hungry a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, even waking up at night and eating in the middle of the night because I was starving. Gosh, okay. People, people were amazed by how much, I was amazed by how much I was eating. You know, I would eat two meals, in, you know, yeah. sometimes. Wow, okay. <laughs> that's, that's amazing because um, obviously if you're eating, your body then has to use energy to digest it. So um, that was why I couldn't, I found that I would just get exhausted from eating soup. So, um, yeah, I was the opposite, but yeah, so that, that's interesting link perhaps to the leaky gut situation there as well. Yeah, and actually just, yeah, definitely I felt that exhaustion. One thing that did really help, which fascinated me, is if I ate half a grapefruit at the beginning of a meal, I wouldn't feel so exhausted. And this doctor ah. said, well, actually there are enzymes in the grapefruit, uh, which are helping your, you know, digestive system work. And he actually yeah. prescribed digestive enzymes. As yeah. Treatment. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. That's, we'll, we'll, that's another topic, perhaps. <laughs> um, can, do carry on. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, research. Where did I get to? Um, yeah. So leaky gut. So um, yeah, research singled out particularly dysbiosis, which again is the the balance of the microbiome. Um, and increased intestinal permeability, leaky gut, um, to investigate further and the nutritional treatment um, for leaky gut and found that symptoms of fatigue um, actually improved. Um, and that what the leaky gut is actually causing is a buildup of toxins in the body, which you know you experience, um, and then causes an immune response and then a cascade just continues from there. Right. Um, the final body system to consider then is the HPA access um, and its potential dysfunction. So um, stress plays a large role in affecting the hypothalamus pituitary and adrenal ac access, which is the HPA access. Um, and the development and in, in the development and maintenance of CFS um, in patients. So the most generalized characteristic of the HPA access is, um, is in the reduction of cortisol. So cortisol is your um, stress hormone. So it would lead on from your short burst of adrenaline, which is your fight or flight. Yeah. Um, and then in chronic stress, cortisol would actually lead on from that um, and, and can be much longer lasting. Um, so underlying low levels of cortisol actually flag changes in the HPA axis. So it's like it's been, the cortisol has actually been overused and is now completely depleted. Um, so it would include things like reduced daytime cortisol, in, which then leads to an enhanced negative feedback to the HPA axis and then blunts the HPA um, responsiveness. So then you don't have that energy resource um, to get away from the tiger in a fight or flight situation. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but what's interesting is that that actually seems to be something that's developed after the onset of um, CFS. Um, and yeah, so at which point it then sort of helps to maintain the symptoms of the disease rather than being the, the initial cause. Right. Um, but yeah, so that's quite an interesting factor. Um, and then finally, um, just to consider environmental toxins. Um, so clean living is really uh, the best way forward for someone that's trying to recover to keep, you know, toxins to a minimum. Um, several studies have reported pesticides in, and insecticides, which are obviously on, on and in all non-organic foods, uh, mercury, lead and nickel um, connected to the symptoms of CSF. Um, sorry, CFS, getting all <laughs> my letters mixed up. Um, 
So in addition to that, research into uh, food intolerances are also being conducted. Um, since food intolerances may be involved in the um, presenting symptoms of, uh, of CFS patients. Um, and a recent study suggests that celiac can also present with neurological symptoms in the absence of um, gastrointestinal systems, sy symptoms. Um, and so that can also be implicated in um, CFS as well. And then lastly, uh, literature also is looking at a number of nutritional um, deficiencies, which may have contributing factors into the onset and development of CFS. And that would include things like B vitamins, vitamin C, uh, magnesium, sodium, zinc, um, L-tryptophan, L-carnitine, uh, CoQ10, and essential fatty acids. So that's kind of just a summary of the, the research that's going on and areas that they're looking at. Excellent. And a um, couple of questions, and these might be bigger topics that we may, might need to come back to. But um, so you've talked about a number of things, mitochondria, sort of leaky gut, etc. Is there any thinking around what's causing those dysfunctions? Um, there's no research for the sort of the, the originating factors, um, but it was certainly in, in my experience, um, my onset was through a, a period of um, emotional stress. Yeah. And I think that that can be quite common um, starting point with um, any CFS sufferers. So um, I think stress is one of the, the big factors but how that then leads on to say um, your mitochondria to dysfunction and not be able to produce enough energy um, hasn't been pinpo pinpointed mm -hmm. obviously it can be linked to things like inflammation and oxidative stress and inflammation can then lead on to something like leaky gut so there's kind of a little cascade of some links but there's nothing definitive yeah and you know certainly from stuff I've in fact I've got one book here that this book I refer to a lot, a um, book by Professor Robert Sapolsky called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And he talks yeah. about the different forms of stress being acute, chronic, and psychological and social. And so for each person, the, comb you know, the combination of those stresses might be different. Yeah. So for some people, uh, they might have an acute stress, like, you know, having an injection and having a reaction to it or a reaction to medication. Um, so my sense is that the mix is going to be different for each individual. For sure, I know for me as well, uh, the stress of my job was a, and lifestyle were major factors in me developing the condition. But that might be completely different for other people i just want to make that clear um so okay no thanks for that and the other quick question um was you mentioned things like lead etc do you recommend people use water filters absolutely yes yeah. and if so i mean we don't have to talk about it here but are there certain products that you'd recommend yes so the berkey filter is um is a really have you heard of it yeah 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 yeah, yeah. it's it's the best one on the market for sure definitely not the cheapest <laughs> but um i think it pays its dues over time and it's got a lot of um studies to show that it, it it's eliminating a lot of things out of the water right. you know a lot of heavy metals um the possibly hormonal aspect to the water you know like with the contraceptive pill and things like that um, particularly in London, we're recycling our water so that the hormone actually can maintain in the water that we're then drinking, which can cause upset as well. Yeah. Um, and it actually um, says that there's potential for that to be decreased in the water as well. So, yeah, um, you know, starting with a Brita is good. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, is, is there a budget option? Because I, I think the book is about £300 or something like that yeah around that price yeah so there are the, you know something like the britain might be a more budget option for people if if that's out of the range, their range. Ab yeah absolutely and that does reduce some heavy metal content in the water as well right okay so thanks 
uh, for sharing those thoughts. If people want to get in touch with you direct, where, they, where can they find you? Yeah, great. So um, you can go to my website, which is www.livingenergynutrition.co.uk or um, you can email me at crystal at livingenergynutrition.co.uk or go to my Facebook page under the same name. Excellent. So just for anyone watching, we are going to be doing a number of videos on different topics. So look out for those videos. But for now, thanks for watching and thanks, Crystal, for sharing your thoughts on this topic. Okay, thank you for having me. Okay, bye for now. Bye-bye.